This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gido Yort. It's Friday, August 14th. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future, as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VOA headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on and we appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. Thousands have been arrested in Ethiopia following deadly protests last month, according to the country's Human Rights Commission, raising concerns that the country is returning to tactics from its repressive past. David Dio reports. Opposition activist Dejane Tafar was asleep next to his pregnant wife when police knocked at the door. The university professor and secretary of Ethiopia's Oromo Federalist Congress Party was arrested a month ago, and he's not alone. More than 9,000 people have been detained since violent protests erupted at the start of July, according to the country's state-run Human Rights Commission. Raising fears that a government hailed for reforms is returning to the iron-fisted tactics of past administrations. Dejane's wife, Aselefetch Mulatu, says a week after he was jailed, her husband had contracted coronavirus. We never anticipated the occurrence of this situation. We thought we had transitioned to a democratic system. A spokesman for Ethiopia's health ministry confirmed Dejane had been hospitalised, but said he has since recovered. Protests in which 178 people were killed erupted after the murder of popular singer Harchalu Hundesa at the end of June. His music was seen as the soundtrack of demonstrations that liberated the country from one of Africa's most repressive regimes and saw reformist Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed come to power in 2018. He's transformed the political and economic landscape, including promising the country's first free and fair elections in 2021. But those changes have also unleashed old disputes over land, resources and local power. And Abiy has struggled to rein in the resurgent ethnic nationalism that sporadically explodes into bouts of violence. That led his government, Amnesty International's Ethiopia researcher Fisehe Tekle says, turning to the methods of the past. The latest trend is that the government is uh, uh, going back to uh, the, the iron fist uh, methods. Uh, and uh, they are uh, still detaining people without proper investigation. There are uh, protracted uh, pre-trial detentions happening. A regional spokesman confirmed that more than 7,000 people had been arrested in the Oromia region alone, home to Ethiopia's largest ethnic group. A spokesperson for the Prime Minister said one of the government's primary responsibilities is ensuring security and stability, and that the rule of law prevails. David Doyle of Reuters with that report. Tensions are still running high in Ivory Coast's commercial capital, Abidjan, Friday, just one day after police used tear gas to break up street protests against President Alassane Ouattara's controversial decision to seek a third term. At least one protester was killed in Abidjan's Yopougon district as police chased down protesters who set up roadblocks made from burning tires and furniture. An opposition official told BOA three people were killed in Daukuro, the hometown of former president and current presidential candidate Henry Conan Bidie. There have been scattered demonstrations in the Ivory Coast since Watara announced last week he is seeking re-election despite the opposition accusing him of violating term limits. Watara is challenging the two-term presidential law, saying a new constitution adopted in 2016 offset any barriers preventing him from running again. In Cameroon, a spokesperson for the interim government of the self-proclaimed Federal Republic of Ambazonia says the group has launched a probe into the brutal killing of a young woman as seen in a video that has gone viral. However, Chris Anu, Secretary of State for Communications of the self-proclaimed Republic of Ambazonia, 
says from preliminary investigations, the group cannot say whether its forces carried out the killing. According to Reuters, the video shows the young woman with her hands behind her back being bitten by several young men who then slit her throat with a machete. The Ambazonia separatists are fighting the Cameroon military for independence of the country's English-speaking regions. The World Health Organization says Africa's coronavirus outbreak appears to be slowing, although it warns cases are still accelerating in some countries and that the data should be interpreted cautiously. Sisipo Sikweya has the details. There has been an encouraging slowdown in Africa's coronavirus outbreak, according to the World Health Organization. The international health body said that for the week ending August 11th, there were 75,326 new cases, an increase of 9%. That's positive because it's down from a 13% rise the week before and 18% two weeks ago. South Africa, the continent's epicenter, reported nearly 45,000 new cases over the past week. That's around 60% of the total. But the WHO says it's evidence of a remarkable downward trend. More than 61,500 new cases were reported in South Africa a week ago and just under 78,000 the week before. South Africa, therefore, is driving the decline in the figures but several countries continue to observe rising numbers of infections and deaths. Among those seeing the highest increases were Gambia with an 85% surge as well as Botswana, Namibia and Angola. The WHO also warned that though the continent-wide data appears to be encouraging, the figures should be interpreted cautiously as they may be affected by factors including testing capacity. That was Sisipo Sikoyea of Reuters with that report. The annual great migration of wildlife across Tanzania and Kenya usually attracts thousands of tourists on safari, bringing income to trade that depend on them, such as souvenir makers. But the COVID-19 pandemic has caused tourism numbers to plunge, and Kenya's craftsmen and women are suffering. In Narok, Kenya, Women who specialize in beadwork for tourists are seeing their incomes drop to a fraction of what they were last year. Lenny Ruvaga reports. Kenya's Maasai Mara National Reserve normally has almost as many tourists as wildebeests for the annual great migration of wildlife from Tanzania. But tourism is struggling to recover after authorities lifted March COVID-19 local travel restrictions in July and international ones just this month. In the last six months, we have lost almost $800 million in terms of revenue for the government. Definitely, we were expecting to have $2 billion revenue for the, for, for the government from tourism. But because of the pandemic, that's a big loss. But with just a trickle of tourists, many of Kenya's souvenir sellers remain closed and the craftsmen and women are struggling to make a living. Noel Tapari Kisime heads a group of 3,000 beadwork artists, all of them women. They've seen their incomes drop to a fraction of the $100 per month average they and their families depend on. As a leader of the women in this area, most, if not all, have been expecting answers from me on how to survive the pandemic. I am totally disoriented and helpless on what to tell them and how to weather this storm. To help the crafts women to get by, local aid groups have been donating food. When they are also not skilled to have uh, alternatives in life, you know, people who have not gone to school, they, they are very much limited. So if something is one door is closed, then they have no other way to uh, pursue other, uh, other, other opportunities. Nairok authorities say they are also providing food to around 800 families in the area. We had even to go and feed those communities which are living around the game reserve because they are heavily affected by the loss of business in this game reserve. Kenya's safari tourism is slowly recovering. Meanwhile, locals are holding on, hoping one day soon the herds of tourists will again rival the wildlife. Lenny Ruvaga for VOA News, Narok, 
Kenya. With many Turkish beaches packed, the Turkish health minister is warning about the risk of an upsurge in COVID-19 infections. The warning comes as critics question official state figures on infections, which show the rates as remaining stable. Turkey is claiming success in containing the virus, and Ankara is lobbying the European Union to lift its controls on visits to Turkey in a bid to revive its tourism industry. Dorian Jones reports from Istanbul on the government's difficult balancing act. Istanbul's main high street is back to its vibrant self. But the government's nationwide easing of restrictions is leading to a surge in coronavirus infections, back to past peaks of a thousand daily. And the situation could be even worse. The data we receive indicates that in a lot of provinces, the numbers of confirmed patients are at a much higher rate. And the city of Urfa gives its daily numbers as 300, Diabrica gives us 350, and Antep gives us 300. We can deduce the actual rates for Turkey. On Twitter, Health Minister Farettin Kocha strongly defended his ministry's infection statistics. Meanwhile, nationwide police controls are being reintroduced to enforce mask wearing. And the reopening of schools is being delayed by a month. Some doctors a month ago were warning of the cost of easing controls. Istanbul done. The increase in infections is the result of people traveling from Istanbul to other regions, either for holiday or family visits in their homelands. This increase is an expected increase. At this point, this increase is not something we can't manage medically, but precautions are very important. The government is under pressure to return to normalcy as it seeks to save its vital tourism industry. With its famous Genovese Tower, Istanbul's Galata district should be packed with European tourists. Closed shops and empty tables are a testament to the crisis facing the industry. We can't think of COVID too much because the fear of economic crisis weighs heavier. Of course, we are paying attention to our health and taking all the precautions in work. But what we are afraid of is not catching COVID, but more of what are we going to do? Tourism, not only a vital source of employment, but also of foreign revenue. The lira is suffering heavy losses as international investor concerns grow over Turkey's rapidly diminishing foreign reserves. Russia and Germany's easing of travel restrictions to some key Turkish beach resorts offers the tourism sector some relief. But many fear such relief may prove too little too late and that Turkey will pay a heavy price for easing its COVID-19 restrictions. COVID-19 is a disease caused by the coronavirus. Doreen Jones for VOA News, Istanbul. Continuing travel restrictions and border closures are separating many unmarried couples. But the Love is Not Tourism movement is hoping to get couples back together. Karina Bafrajasian has the story. Since mid-March, thousands of unmarried international couples have become part of the Love is Not Tourism movement. They have signed petitions in the hope of convincing governments to allow them to see their loved ones again. It started with Denmark, right? Um, this started uh, late to, actually, I believe they started organizing before May even, um, but it was the realization that Denmark's uh, families and partners could gather together, create a hashtag, um, petition their government for a sweetheart law. And um, they were able to have that law implemented, or excuse me, announced in June 19th, 2020. In the United States, unfortunately, we have not received um, much of any response, uh, nothing like in Europe. Similar laws were implemented in other European countries, including Norway, the Netherlands, the Czech Republic and Austria. In other parts of the world, the situation is more complicated. American Elizabeth Thorne and Colombian Mario have been dating for a few years, but because of the pandemic, they have not seen each other for over six months. Strict travel restrictions in Colombia don't allow them to meet even in the third country. In order to avoid these problems in the future, they have decided to get married. Because we're not married, we, at, in this moment we're trying to get a marital civil union because it's the only thing that 
we can really do while we're separated in the 21st century, how it's funny oh. that, you know, like people who are not married are not considered family. It's such an outdated kind of way to view family. The lockdown and travel restrictions have created a lot of challenges for unmarried couples. In some cases, even unmarried couples with a child can't be together. But the members of the Love is Not Tourism say they will follow the rules if they are allowed to be together. And we want to follow the rules. We're more than willing to pay for our own coronavirus tests. We're willing to quarantine. Um, we're willing to wear masks. Even though in the United States we have seen a pushback against masks, that's not a problem for us. We're willing to social distance. Um, we just need a solution in place. Thanks to social distancing, even couples that live in the same town have become long-distance partners. But psychologists say it's possible to make it through. You can make it through those times by holding strong, holding true, and saying, wait a second, even though I can't see them physically, right? Can't hug them, touch them, you know, cuddle with them, whatever I want, but I can be connected with them emotionally. This is what American Susan Parker and her fiancé from the Netherlands, Egbert, been trying to do for the last few months. They talk to each other every day and dream about their future wedding. The couple met last winter and were planning to get married until COVID-19 interfered. I didn't know what to do. And not too long ago, a neighbor of mine saw an article in, uh, I think it was the New York Times, talking about this group, uh, Love is Not Tourism. And I thought to myself, oh, that so perfectly describes the situation. Susan and Egbert are among the lucky ones. On July 27th, the Netherlands allowed travel for foreigners that are in a relationship with Dutch citizens. So the couple may resume their wedding plans, finally in person. Karina Befredjen for VOA News, Washington. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Africa 54. The selection of California Senator Kamala Harris as vice presidential running mate to presumptive U.S. Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden is both a historic making and politically safe choice, according to analysts. As the first African-American and South Asian woman on a major party ticket, Harris brings unprecedented diversity to the contest. He is VOA's Brian Pardon. Kamala Harris had long been seen as the front runner in presumptive Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden's vice presidential search. This is a moment of real consequence for America. The California senator met his criteria for a highly qualified woman. Biden also faced pressure from within his party to choose an African-American at a time when much of the country is focused on racial justice. I think it's a great choice by Biden. Look, it's up to him right now to run a safe, smart campaign. Kamala Harris is a known entity. She's trusted. She's someone who has been vetted on the national stage, and she's a smart pick for it. The selection of Harris, the daughter of Jamaican and Indian immigrants, should energize key Democratic constituencies. I'm really happy that it's her, and obviously as a black woman, uh, it's, it's just remarkable to see, you know, myself sort of represented on a national ticket in my lifetime. So 
uh, I, I'm really excited about it. Harris boasts experience as California's former top prosecutor and in the Senate, where she gained prominence for her tough questioning of President Donald Trump's nominees, including Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh at his 2018 confirmation hearing. A dynamic speaker, the one-time rival of Biden for the nomination is expected to be a formidable opponent to Republican Vice President Mike Pence on the debate stage. President Trump called Harris mean and disrespectful for her grilling of Kavanaugh. Trump also called Harris nasty, amplifying reported criticism within Biden's own team over Harris's attack on Biden's record during a past debate, accusing him of opposing school busing to increase racial integration in the 1970s, a charge that Biden said was a mischaracterization. And the Trump campaign put out an early attack ad calling Harris a radical leftist. The Trump campaign is not going to be shy. They have the money, uh, they have the weaponry, they have the ammunition to take down such a choice. It is unclear whether branding Harris a radical will resonate with voters. Some believe the attacks could backfire if seen as overly sexist. I do think they need to be very careful because they will turn off those white suburban women voters who they so desperately need in order to win this election. The choice of Harris, a relative political moderate in a party trending leftward, could solidify Biden's support among pro-business independents. But she may disappoint the most progressive elements of the party, demanding radical government intervention in the economy. Harris is seen as a safe choice for a campaign that is already ahead in public opinion polls, challenging a president whose leadership is being put to the test by the pandemic and an economic crisis. Brian Patton, VOA News, Washington. U.S. President Donald Trump on Thursday announced that Israel and the United Arab Emirates have agreed to normalize relations. The Abraham Accord is only the third Israel-Arab peace deal since Israeli independence in 1948. In a joint statement, Trump, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and Abu Dhabi Crown Prince Mohammed al Nayyan said they hope the historic breakthrough will advance peace in the Middle East. As part of the deal, Israel would suspend its plans to annex large parts of Palestinian land in the West Bank. VOA White House correspondent Patsy Widakuswara has our story. Emirati Muslims can now pray in the historic Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem after the United Arab Emirates announced Thursday it has normalized relations with Israel. At the White House, President Donald Trump applauded the announcement. Now that the ice has been broken, I expect more Arab and Muslim countries will follow the United Arab Emirates lead. The UAE-Israel agreement is only the third Israel-Arab peace deal since Israel's declaration of independence in 1948. Egypt signed one in 1979 and Jordan in 1994. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called it a historic day, a sentiment supported by administration officials. It wouldn't surprise me uh, if the president's eventually nominated for a Nobel Prize. In terms of a step towards regional peace, I think that that part is currently being, being exaggerated. There was never a threat of, of a conflict between Israel and the UAE. Um, but this is the first Gulf state to, uh, to normalize relations with Israel, and that's going to open up a lot of new possibilities for the two countries. As part of the deal, Israel has agreed to suspend further annexation of Palestinian land in the West Bank. Analysts say that taking annexation off the table benefits Israel strategically since it won't absorb a significant number of Palestinians against their will. Thus putting over the long term Israel in a really terrible position of choosing whether they're going to pick their Jewish identity or their identity as a liberal democratic state. Um, that's, a, that's not a situation that any friend of Israel wants to see Israel in over the long run. The UAE-Israel deal is seen as further isolating another regional power, Iran. The U.S. is currently trying to push a U.N. Security Council resolution to extend an arms embargo on Tehran due to expire in October. China and Russia have signaled they will veto it. If the resolution fails, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has threatened to invoke the snapback option, restoring all U.N. sanctions on Iran. We're not going to talk to you about that. We're going to work something out and then we'll talk after it's completed. But it'll be a very satisfactory. Trump said the UAE and Israel will join the U.S. to formally sign the agreement in Washington in the next few weeks. 
Patsy Widakuswara, VOA News at the White House. In our entertainment segment, with concerts, festivals, tours, and award shows all around the world canceled or put on indefinite hold, many professional musicians and composers who had relied on performances for their income have found themselves in a difficult situation. Maria Pruz reports and analyzes, narrates our story. A fiery mix of bluegrass, Irish, folk and rock music brought by a DC-based band Scythian has been entertaining a Facebook crowd live twice a month. What started as a smartphone webcast in March evolved into a full-scale, multi-camera, professional-sounding performance called Warren Stream. Every stream will have between 15 and 20 festivals and music venues partnering and cross-posting with us. And so we've been averaging about 50,000 views per stream. <laughs> I mean, we don't, we don't get paid for those views, but we ask people for Venmo tips or like PayPal, and the people have been incredibly generous. Uh, so that's how we've been surviving till now. Not only did Scythian largely depend on the festivals, they were planning their sixth annual Bluegrass Festival in Virginia mountains that attracted over 8,000 people last year. Entertainment has always been recession-proof. So our band has survived two recessions. When people are not are doing poorly in recessions, they, need, they want to go out and forget. And we were excited about this year, and then all of a sudden, yeah, it's just, it's probably not going to happen. Um, but I think if we can keep on growing our fan base with the corn streams, then when we go back to doing the festival, more people are going to know about us than ever before. Andrew Krause, a Maryland-based concert pianist, has also started his Facebook classical music series called Respite. He says he has always advised his students to look for sources of additional income, but it's up to the audience whether or not to support his work online. If you want artists to be able to produce content, you have to support us. Because if we are working 18 hours a day at something else, then we don't have the energy, time, and ultimately the expertise to produce anything for you that you're really going to want to listen to. It will truly become the age of the amateur. Meanwhile, Krause advises musicians to keep their hopes up and teach online. A little bit different, but you can learn to use that technology and make it work for you. And this is a great time for it. I mean, it's summer, the kids are out of school, they can't go anywhere much. So this would be the time to go and, and advertise. Musicians agree that if the industry survives, it's going to come out of the pandemic looking very different. And musicians will no doubt be able to develop a whole new creative approach. Maria Proust in Washington, VOA News. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com from all of us here in Washington. Have a great weekend.